Y muy buenos días a todos. Este, antes que nada, pues les agradezco su participación en este webinar de la Sociedad Mexicana de Simulación. El día de hoy tenemos la oportunidad de tener con nosotros a tres extraordinarios simulacionistas de Europa que nos van a compartir su experiencia utilizando la cuestión de simulación en el manejo y sobre todo en la prevención y planes a futuro para capacitar a la gente empleando la simulación ante una contingencia como es el COVID-19. El día de hoy nuestros, nuestros presentadores van a ser el doctor Peter Dickman, este, que nos, este, que, con quien vamos a empezar la, la plática. Vamos a tener también a Sigrun Anna Kimsdedland de Noruega y vamos a tener también como ponente a Libby Thomas desde eh, Reino Unido. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here. Thank you for your time. And uh, you are free to start. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And thank you very much for taking the time to all of you to, to listen to this webinar. We honored that you're interested in our work here. We, we are only representing a small part basically of the work that that is done and and also the people that are behind the work here we all represent larger teams and we only the the faces showing off now so we we come back to that but would we really like to emphasize also the work of our colleagues the basic idea of this webinar is uh, to talk about the role of simulation in, in dealing with infectious disease outbreaks like COVID-19. Maybe there will be other uh, similar outbreaks in the future, so maybe we can actually prepare for this. The basic idea is that I would set the scene with some more general concepts. And then uh, Sigrun will talk about the experiences from Stavanger in Norway and Libby will talk about the experiences from London and the UK. And then in the end, we, we plan to have question and answers. The whole, uh, the whole presentation is based on this paper that is uh, published in Advances in Simulation. It's an open access paper uh, that we actually have written together here between Denmark, Norway, and the UK. If you're interested, just go in there and you can read this for free and also share it if you if you like it um i have to find my slides here so stepping back a little bit i'm i'm working the organizational psychologist so i cannot tell you anything about the clinical aspect of the situation but you know kind of maybe helping in understanding what needs to be done in terms of the training issues in terms of kind of thinking it through from a safety perspective so Basically, the situation that we have in the moment is uh, sensitive to errors. We want to try to treat patients as good as we can. We always want to do that. Stakes are high, but also in this situation, kind of the personal risk for the healthcare professionals is higher than potentially in other cases where you actually are in the risk of getting the infection yourself, of spreading it to, uh, to your family members. And I think it's actually interesting also on, on the social media where you see, you know, the ways that people actually talk about this personal risk. And I think Libby will also come back to this uh, in her presentation. And then also the training in the clinical environment is, is risky of getting the infection yourself. And even in the simulation environment, it's risky. And again, also we both presentations will come back to that. How can you deal with this? And potentially reducing the risk of getting infected during the training environment. So in summary, you know, kind of this situation really makes a, a huge case for using simulation because simulation can mitigate some of this risk and by this also reducing the cognitive loads that people have, for example, thinking about their own infections. And in this sense, to hopefully improve the learning experience to respond on the different levels. The different levels actually would be uh, on, on an educational focus, educational level. On the more individual part, there you kind of have some elements, some skills, some knowledge that you want to learn to, for example, ask, help people to function in uh, positions that they were not used to to train a regular ward nurse, for example, to function as an intensive care uh, nurse, 
that would be an example for the educational focus. The system focus would then be to not only, only in citation marks train people to do their job, but also to see how is the job that they are doing actually connected to the whole system. What is the workflow? How is the information flow uh, that we that we need that we have in the system? Uh, which kind of resources do we need? Where? So insights often also from an educational focus of simulation where you run simulations to train people in something. Sometimes you often, uh, sometimes you also get insights into, you know, how should we set up the system around their work so that it's actually optimized on a system basis uh, and not only the individual basis. And the last focus that we actually have identified and we think is, or I think is very interesting, important is this personal focus, where I think the danger of getting infected yourself actually emphasizes quite a bit also the emotional side of being a professional health care person. And, and the, the, the personal focus would be then to help actually healthcare professionals with simulation to stay healthy in the situations uh, that they are standing in themselves, not only physically, but also emotionally uh, and psychologically staying safe there. Some examples here for focus points, dealing, putting on infections, uh, protection gear, donning, doffing, dealing with COVID-19 patients, uh, how can we increase staffing those so that people actually can help in positions that they might not be used to? What kind of uh, knowledge would they need? I think also important uh, that the crisis might change decision making patterns, where often you would, in principle, aim to, to ask senior colleagues whenever you have a doubt about things. In the preparation, especially where we were really concerned about the capacity issues, the, the notion was and still is that the senior colleagues might not be so accessible anymore in the in the crisis, so that you actually might have to take decisions on the spot. For example, also pre-hospital that you would normally discuss with a more experienced colleague, and what kind of impact would that actually have? Again, also psychologically speaking, how can we support people in this? Then clear leadership, followership, always important, but also in this crisis situation might have a big advantage. The, the system focus, I already spoke a little bit around this kind of where would you need equipment? How can you make layouts of the rooms? How could patients also flow through the hospital to minimize infectious uh, risks? Could there be one-way streets, for example, of transporting patients? And then the, the last focus here, the personal focus, how can we actually support people? And I think what's really, really important here is that people are very different in how they respond in a crisis situation, that they might have wishes that are very different in terms of support. And I think a lot of our abilities that we have as debriefers, listening to people, trying to understand their frames behind actions actually would be very helpful to listen people also in this after these uh, challenging experiences and to to listen to them and find the best way of how we could support them so respecting this individuality of reactions in a crisis situation what i think really is in, interesting that we have a window of opportunity uh, to make the emotional strain to lift that from the personal space into the professional space so where we i think actually have a chance to establish this as something as a legitimate part of professionalism to be scared to be in doubt around things and how do we actually deal with this i think in mo in the moment as i see it as an out outsider that is pretty much on the personal shoulders of people who are working in healthcare and i think in the moment we have the chance with the crisis situation and our ability of simulation facilitators to lift that into a, into the professional space to actually uh, discuss these issues in many occasions not only as a personal issue but as part of your job and you need to find a professional way also to deal with these issues another aspect is kind of you know when there is work 
how can we help the individual person to uh, to solve problems how can we help people to actually work together that is quite a bit of a focus in most of our simulation trainings in peace times and also now but how can we a simulation community also contribute to an organizational development so what we see in simulation scenarios what we see in debriefings that can be treated as individual learning experiences peter needs to learn around this and that you can also see that as a more systematic uh, element to find out why did peter not know this in the first place was that purely a PETA problem or does that point out to a larger uh, connection to other parts of the educational system, for example? Or if you see that many, several people have, for example, problem in, problems in putting on the personal protection uh, equipment, is there tips and tricks that you could actually share from your simulation experiences into the organization? So I think, especially in these times, we should keep an open eye in all our simulation activities and debriefing activities. Is there anything that we have seen here that should be, uh, uh, where our organization should be informed of, around this? Should anybody else know what we just saw? And I think it's uh, an interesting uh, Times also window of opportunity position to position simulation activity simulation centers as some as units who can actually help with this organizational change. This notion of work as imagined work is done. I think it's also very important and, and the big chance for simulation activities to actually show. So this is how you really do it in practice, not only in citation marks how it's written in the books, and but but the the algorithm for example that you have created for the COVID-19 uh, patients. If you really put that into practice in different parts of your hospital, in different locations, how does this unfold in practice and where might there be weak points, where is bottlenecks and so on. So I think there's a good chance also to use simulation to, to investigate this potential difference here. When you do that, to kind of think through each activity uh, what is actually the input, what would trigger the activity, what is the output that you want to have from this, what is time aspects, how long does do things take, is there a sequence that you would need to keep, what kind of control mechanisms do you have, is there official guidelines, is there unofficial deviations from guidelines, the culture, how do we do things around here, what would be the prerequisites to actually do the, the activity in a good way? And what are the resources that you need while it's running? And how are potentially different activities connected to each other? So I think when you, when you design scenarios for COVID-19 or any kind of scenarios, and when you do the debriefings, I think this uh, model here is quite helpful to, to kind of systematize your thinking. And you see the reference here, it's a, it's a huge framework that's behind this hexagon here. Um, so to summarize, I think when we do needs analysis, that should be the basis basically for, for good training events, to think of people, to think of the tasks that they do, but also of the different contexts in which people are working. And I think both the experiences here from Norway and from the UK will you know, illustrate some of these points on a more practical basis. We agreed basically to, to have the presentations in a row and take questions in the end. So I would pass over to Sigrun here. Thanks. Can you hear me now? I think so. Yes. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks also very much to all of you for inviting us to be with you tonight. Um, it's often nice to meet you at conferences and meetings, but this will have to do for now. Um, I was thinking about what you said now, Peter. Um, uh, with the work at the bottom and the I and the we and the organization, a lot of what we've been doing uh, in C2 team training at our hospital, we've been finding it out rapidly how to improve our systems and feeding it back to the organization. And I would just like to, just like to remind or impress upon everybody that a simulation, we have to make sure that our organizations and the wards where we're training and our institutions, that we have, we have to be very conscious of the value it brings and promoting the value it brings. 
uh, I think that it, as long as people see the value in it, they'll appreciate it and learn over time how to use it to improve their services. I think that's important. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So a little bit about what I'd like to talk to you about for the next few minutes is about the context we work in. I think that's important to understand how we've been working, the requests we received from our organization, how we worked, some examples of what we've been doing since uh, the 11th or 12th of March, feedback to the organization, and some of my reflections about challenges and enablers that have uh, affected how we've been working. So on the right there, you see a picture of our fjord in Norway. We live in, in Southwest Norway and uh, it's in Stavanger and that's our hospital there. So we have a population for our hospital of 366,000, uh, 7,800 employees. Many of them work part-time, also full-time, uh, predominantly somatic or medical surgical beds and then 277 psychiatric beds also including district, the district around us here. Thank you, next slide please. And I thought maybe it'd be interesting for you to hear a little bit about our national statistics before I get into the details about how we've been working. It's a, it's a, time, it's a long country with few people. So 5.3 million people, beautiful long country. Uh, so far, actually today, 170,000 people have been tested for COVID, uh, 7,710 positive. At our hospital, approximately 1,100 referred with a, referred to the hospital with a, with the question, "Could this be COVID?" Uh, and in the hospitals in Norway, until now, 900, 998 people have been admitted with COVID. At our hospital, Stavanger University Hospital, 51. And then at the ICUs in the whole country of Norway, 214 patients have been admitted to the ICUs. At our hospital, 11. And COVID-related deaths in, in the whole country, 204, four at our hospital. And I was thinking about um, when the, the corona or the COVID crisis started, when we started taking it seriously early March, we had no idea how bad it was going to be. We had no idea about what the results would be like nobody else did. So we just prepared for the worst um, and then I'll try and try and explain a little bit about my thoughts about these numbers, but also about what we did to try and deal with it at our hospital. And these are the, the statistics from the National Public Health Institute. They're published every day. Thank you. Next slide, please. Next click. So a little bit about our context where we work here in Stavanger. Uh, for many years, 20 years, 15, 20 years, we've had a uh, formal focus on simulation at my hospital. Uh, a large amount of the activity has been due to our foundation in our city called the Safer Simulation Foundation. And it has been founded by Lairdal Medical, which is based here in Stavanger, the Stavanger University Hospital where I'm working, and the University of Stavanger. Those three institutions went together in 2006 formally and established a simulation foundation, uh, and it's non-for-profit. And we've trained for the hospital, we've trained at least three, 400 facilitators over these years, and maybe a third are very active. And some of them are very, very active and use simulation a lot for their hospitals. And it's about 40, 45% at the center they train here and 55% in situ where they work. So I work predominantly with postgraduate education. And then the lower um, picture there, RegSim, uh, I'm leading a health west region in Norway. All the, Almost all the hospitals in Norway are public, public owned. And uh, the Western region of Norway commissioned uh, my hospital and Safer to get uh, up and running a, a network in our region of uh, five major hospitals in order to assure quality in simulation and professionalize simulation and, and try and ensure that it's meeting the needs of the society. And we've also been tasked uh, just before Corona with uh, leading a national task force in simulation. So the national authorities have expectations that all of the hospitals will use simulation and they will collaborate and share how they work. So that's a bit about our simulation context here. And then the next slide, or the next click. Uh, in Norway also we have daily government briefings on TV. And that's a picture down below of four of our ministers properly socially distancing, giving us briefs and updates every day. Um, so I was thinking about the numbers in Norway. Um, uh, the Norwegian society, I would say, has a high degree of trust in the authorities and the government. And as in May, in, in March, um, uh, people who've been traveling abroad were, were, were requested to quarantine 14 days. And 
this is a very high degree of compliance to these requests and any suspected COVID-19 cases were quarantined. Uh, immediately they set, in, uh, set up a social distancing rules. Schools were closed the day after Denmark. Uh, many, many businesses were closed, services were reduced. So that just decreased the movement of people drastically, quickly. And then at the hospitals in general, they just went into lockdown. Maybe there was only one door into each hospital just to reduce the traffic. And practically all non-essential and emergent consultations and referrals were just canceled. Uh, so, so the staffing maybe was slightly increased in some units. Uh, and uh, there was also a re-entry, a call to the public, all healthcare people who were not working in health services again, they were invited back if they want, want some retraining. And this is very well received and very popular. Lots and lots of healthcare people have returned to the workforce to receive training. So the, the, the society has really pulled together to try and uh, deal with this and slow down the, the spread of COVID. So next slide, please. I'm, I'm, I think this was a bit unique, and, and I'm very happy that this happened at our hospital. Um, uh, on the 11th of March at 1 p.m., our chief medical officer through the Department of Education formally requested that uh, those of us working at SAFER and Reg Sim, who are here in Stavanger, uh, please prioritize working with the hospital. Of course, they wanted us to have some experiences, too, that we could share with the region, but uh, they asked us to pull our resources in and help uh, coordinate simulations at the hospital. And he stressed that it was very important to emphasize primarily health and safety and infectious disease control as a focus. And then to ensure, of course, adequate patient treatment and all the stimulation activities or active learning activities we design. And uh, they, they acknowledged, of course, that many personnel would need retraining and relocating training. So we would have to look into that. And we would have to, like Peter was talk, talking about earlier, looking at the workflow and the systems. Um, they asked us to, to also consider training a patient flow and cases involving also PPE gear, et cetera, and looking at the flow and if we could improve it. And then there was a, on the same email, there was just an agreement among senior staff to request us to work with them and develop initiatives for the whole region. And they kindly asked us to prioritize this but also to stay in close contact. They really wanted to have close communication. And um, that was very important, especially initially. Thank you, next slide, please. So how did we work? We were then 13 to 14 people from our hospital, Safer and RegSim. Uh, we pulled together to make a COVID-19 education simulation work group. And that evening, the 11th of March, we just read through that day's um, uh, COVID-19 emergency plan. As you know very well, plans and protocols have been rapidly being adjusted. But we scanned through it. And we found different places where we thought simulation could help, but we also found areas that weren't mentioned. We thought about flow and the amount of patients that might come and how important it would be to be cleaning quickly, how the orderlies would need to be maintaining uh, infectious control. We thought about that staff, we thought about the secretaries, the receptionists, the phlebotomists, people that were meeting and, and, and ensuring flow, how important it was to, to address their needs for training too, as well as of course the ICU and, and uh, critical teams and, and, and such. And we had uh, frequent daily uh, COVID-19 sim work meetings and briefings down below on the right as some of my colleagues on um, Teams. Uh, so we divided us into ourselves into subgroups and we took responsibility for these different activities and we worked very rapidly and together with clinicians. And then we do what we've done for years here. We have a cascade model of developing educators. So we'll give people, we'll help develop concepts and we'll develop the educators, the clinical educators, make sure that they have the, the tools they need to work, conceptual tools, train the trainer, facilitator courses, skills training. So we work together with them now and then we help them get up and going and testing these um, educational initiatives and then we let them go so we could move to the next. And then it was up to them to roll out the, the education and training in their own units. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the examples of the uh, education and learning activities we were, we were behind in helping design with our clinicians. First one was uh, very, very obvious. Uh, we were like, many places in the world, everyone in the world, preparing for a, a huge amount of patients, relatively huge, to our ICUs. And how are we gonna staff the ICUs? Uh, so the, the, this region of Norway commissioned my group 
to prepare first year or junior resident doctors to assist on ICUs, give them the skills they needed to assist as part of a team in an ICU, not replace nurses, not replace doctors, but, but get them ready to work with respirator patients particularly. And what was very nice about that was my colleagues who were in that work group allied themselves with the very experienced educators at the ICU, and uh, they thought it was very important to treat these people as part of the team, and they thought very hard about how can we include them in our teams? How will it be most useful for us and for the patients and for them? And so the product was a one-week course, starting with e-learning and videos and demonstrations, moving into skills training, and then moving into uh, team training and simulation interprofessional. And that course concept has been shared with the rest of the country. We also were working with the receptionists who also work as phlebotomists here in Norway many times and kind of a decision making uh, courses. You know, this is the picture, this is the kind of situation you might be going into, how would you react, what would you think? So we prepared their leads to be able to run this course and then they taught their, taught their own people this, this course. There was a very clear um, uh, order from the psychiatric division how can, you, um, how can you help us prepare our, our employees to deal with potential patients in the psychiatric wards with COVID-19, but also how can we de-escalate potentially um, uh, irritated or, or even violent, angry patients and still maintain uh, infectious control? So we put a lot of work into that with um, really, really good facilitators from the psychiatric division and educators and the infectious control ward too. Together we made a, 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 a kind of a, an, an instructional course that they ran through Skype, distributed to the different uh, psychiatric wards. Well, of course we wish they could run simulations, but you know we have to build up to that because of the, the close contact you'd need with these cases. Also in C2 team training at my hospital for years, we've been running trauma, cardiac arrest, peripartum cases, rapid response team cases, uh, in the emergency, stroke, neonatal cases, lots and lots of training uh, with simulation in C2. So we just immediately, everybody agreed those patients would of course become COVID-19 patients and we'd run them. We've run up to 70 team trainings at our hospital in the last six, seven weeks. For us, that's a lot. And it has been very well received and very well tolerated by everybody, the leads, et cetera. Donning and doffing uh, personal protection equipment, uh, before things got really hot, the uh, uh, infectious control team had done a great job of getting 800 of our employees through uh, one-hour sessions, drop-in, and then uh, my team took over for a week, did another 200, and we really wanted to have that cascade effect, but the system wasn't quite ready for that, so there were very small groups here and there trying to help each other, coach each other with peer-to-peer um, -peer feedback and, and uh, the buddy system on that. And then we have these wards, like probably everyone does, you have to reorganize in your organization. You get this kind of, I call them pop-up wards, pandemia COVID-19 pop-up wards. Sometimes we were invited to come in and train the staff that were being pulled in from different areas to suddenly work together with only cohort patients before the patients came. Sometimes we we're called in a little too late, but we have um, tried to help, of course, in those situations too. And that really brings home the whole concept of just-in-time training, preparing people for these situations. The ambulance service has been has been very clever to uh, to request our services to help them. They have really good educators themselves. So together we do, we devised a PPE cascade station training. So we'd help the educators uh, and with the course modules, and they would run it for their people. And then the um, we needed we thought that or the hospital thought that they would need more EMTs and paramedics quickly up and running on the cars. So we designed courses here, and they came to Safer for those courses. And several people in my work group are paramedics, so they, they really enjoyed that. And that strengthened the relationship with our ambulance service. And uh, every day it's becoming more and more clear the, the stress that a lot of people are feeling with COVID-19. So uh, several of our, uh, especially the nurses and occupational health nurses have been doing rounds and they've been pulling together reflection and discussion groups for nurses and administrators, leads and doctors. Lots of rapid changes, lots of new things to think about, new colleagues, new patients. So that's been important as a um, preventative measure, taking care of our staff. Next slide, please. Next. So these are just some pictures. Um, up in the left top there are three of our clinical leads and simulation leads. 
they are my heroes at the hospital. They're, they're really, really dedicated people like, like you and like lots of your colleagues. So on the left is Professor Martin Kurtz of Neurology. He runs the stroke simulation. In the middle is Dr. Celie Lowen, uh, Celie Olson, I'm sorry. She's a, a medical doctor and works in the A&E and is running the critically ill, um, critically ill teams, rapid response teams. On the right is Dr. Jon Alvestad, the trauma lead. They're very experienced in running simulation now. And across the specialties, they're talking about what they've learned, how to improve the protocols and procedures, and they're running simulations, and they were really on the ball there. On the right, it's a picture you're probably familiar with. This is a little timeout in a trauma patient simulation in situ, where we stop as we're entering the operation theaters, and they're discussing how they're going to move through the workflow, the process, what kind of people need to be aware, and there just a little time out there. This is in situ with a patient, a standard patient. Next slide. Like many people all over the world, we wish we had a lot of proper PPE equipment to train on, but we don't. Uh, so we quickly realized that there was no point in training as we were charged for infectious control situations of COVID-19 if we didn't have anything that resembled PPE equipment. So we um, found, uh, these are my prototypes, I use the stapler, I can't sew. But we found some wonderful seamstresses who've been volunteering their time and they're sewing these. And just a thin piece of fabric like this is enough to cause communication challenges. You can't read people's faces, et cetera. So this, plus we used on the right there, you see um, cloth, cloth frocks, PPE, so we can wash them and reuse them for simulation only. So we had to really be restrictive on using that. Next two pictures, please. And this is just an example of uh, uh, in, in situ simulation where we have, um, we have people, colleagues of ours often, who are uh, volunteering to be patients and we're calling them from our houses and the ambulance gets the call, training, 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 or simulation, and then the call starts to the dispatch. They come home, they pick us up, we run through the whole system and debrief the whole team together. Uh, and uh, often, um, often there've been junior medical doctors, especially who've been the patients, and that's in obviously incredibly helpful and uh, it's a great learning experience to, to really get the feel of what it's like to go through that pathway as a patient. Next slide, please. And I was reflecting a little bit for you about um, how we work in an organization. And this is a picture I really like. I really like this picture from uh, Cotter, his book, Accelerate Harvard Press. It's about organizational structures. They say like in, a, in an organization, you, you, you need both like on the left, very fast moving, innovative development kind of work, people that can make things happen quickly and test things out and, and be innovative. At the same time, obviously on the right, you need formal structures. Uh, you need reporting lines and structures back and forth, more of a centralized kind of leadership. So if we do the next click, uh, Peter, I thought about the, the first, first few weeks uh, were a lot on the left side of the picture here. Very, very flat structure, very easy to communicate through the, the hierarchy in the hospital. Lots of energy, everybody was pulling together. And we did a lot of more face-to-face -face, uh, communication, calling, going over, finding people, talking, not sending mails, not scheduling meetings, just quickly and fast. And we got a lot done. And then if you click again, Peter, over time, um, the organization also started to land a little bit and get their head around everything, you know, and uh, it was becoming slightly more and more formal. And then, you know, can we have weekly presentations? Could we have numbers, registration of activity? Those kind of things started to tick in. So it's an interesting reflection about the dynamics of this whole process. Uh, next slide, please. And next. So obviously a major challenge up on the right is just getting PPE equipment to train with and, and not wasting precious uh, resources. And then something I thought about a lot, collaboration between different support and staff groups in a hospital. We're all charged with, and we all should be working towards providing the public with the best possible care we can. If you work with infection control, if you're the leadership, if you work in education, health and safety, our goal is providing good health care. That's our role in society. And sometimes there's, um, uh, sometimes we know each other and we work well together, sometimes we don't, and we have to get to know each other and we have to find out each other's strengths and weaknesses to collaborate to get to the common goal. So this is also something we've been experiencing for many weeks, you know, and next click, please. So the varying degree of collaboration, getting to know people, finding out how to work together, and, and that's how we get to our bottom line, giving value to society. Uh, next click, please. So some of the enablers, I think, if I think back on this, just this, 
sense of urgency and a tragedy. The organization was able to be incredibly uh, adaptable and change very quickly and rapid processes. It was very exciting, don't get me wrong, but uh, it was very good to work in that kind of climate. Clinicians were incredibly, like Peter was saying, that the personal risk, the personal value of this, protected, they wanted to protect themselves, protect their colleagues, protect themselves and their family when they would go home. They wouldn't want to take the infection with them. So I've never seen such a high degree of engagement in debriefings. And even when we tried to stop the debriefings, because we're very wary about people's time, they wouldn't leave. They'd be there for an extra half hour discussing, testing things, trying to figure things out. It was, it was really beautiful. And the society, like I said, that there's kind of a paradoxical, maybe this is a global phenomenon, paradoxical reduction in normal patients coming to the hospital, which gave us actually a lot of room to train. We weren't crazy busy like we usually are. So, so it's obviously worrying as healthcare personnel, where are these people? But at the same time, there was room to train. Volunteer, volunteer spirit, sewing the masks for us and stuff. The whole organization seems to be going in the same direction quickly. Uh, we had an established context and established simulation resources. We could rapidly reroute to focus on this work. We built on really good face trust and relations we had already. We knew our organization. We have many years established culture for simulation, which, which, which made this the most normal thing in the world to do. And we've all been working very hard to get the results back to improve the systems quickly. And we have a good media department who liaises very well with the organization and society and a very positive rapport. So those are some of the things that I saw as enabling. Yes, next slide. That would be Libby, so thanks for me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Libby Thomas. I'm an emergency medicine physician in London, and I also work in an education um, capacity across Queen, at Queen Mary's University London and King's College Hospital London as well. Um, I've got a special interest in simulation as an education modality and completed my PhD last year looking at an interprofessional simulation in undergraduates um, and what the experience really meant to those people who took part in it. So um, I was involved in this project originally um, as part of my work at King's College Hospital and how we were upskilling the staff in much the same way as Sigrun's kindly shared with us from her experiences in Norway. And that was a fascinating project. We were involved right from mid-February, actually. We started doing our first simulations just with PPE and anticipating the sort of patient cohort coming through. And then in early March, we rapidly upscaled working with our intensive care colleagues and critical care colleagues to really prepare our workforce for what we could see was the impending crisis and the fact that we would have to host large numbers of patients um, in our intensive care units. Um, that really informed all the work that, we put, that I put in towards the paper that we're um, talking about today. But since then, I've moved on to a new project. Um, and I've actually been working with the Nightingale Hospitals in London, which is trying to set up emergency response and to increase our capacity um, in London. So we had a real concern when we looked at the worst case scenarios across the world and the trajectory that London seemed to be heading in in the early days that we would massively have, we wouldn't be able to put all our patients into intensive care, pa in intensive care units that we thought we would need to. Um, we could see that we might be several thousand intensive care beds short of um, our potential need. Um, so two things happened at that stage. One, the hospitals were asked to look at how they could massively increase their intensive care capacity. And this has involved taking over recovery spaces in theatres and theatres themselves, transforming wards into new intensive care units, doubling up patients in all the existing intensive care spaces and things like that. But in addition to that, the Nightingale project was um, launched about the 20th of March, 21st of March. And the idea originated in London and it was to build a 4,000 bed ICU and step down unit in one of our massive exhibition centers. Next slide, please. Um, and so what we could see was that there was originally this London we were going to take over somewhere called the Excel Center, but there was also plans and other very large conurbations across the UK um, and areas where we thought we might have particular need for increased intensive care capacity. The reasons for this was not only to respond to the surge capacity, but we had to train the staff in order to man this. So we had enough staff to look after our hospitals, but actually we were going to need additional staff in order to cope with the pressures in the hospitals and to man these new units. And so there was a massive upskilling required, 
not only did we ask people to come back from retirement, we also graduated our final year nursing and medical students early so they could be deployed onto the wards. Um, and we got lots of other people. We've lost a lot of people from nursing, for instance, in recent years, and a lot of them returned to us, which was amazing. Not only did they need training though, but they needed preparing for the fact this was going to be an unusual environment. It was going to be an ICU environment, which they might not be used to, but it might also be in a massive 600 meter long hall with 2000 beds, which is not what we're used to working in when we're used to working in small bedded and area ICUs. Um, we had to prepare people for the personal risk that both Peter and Sigrun have talked about and the fact that as many of you simulation interest, you think about the aviation comparisons we sometimes draw in um, healthcare and actually for once we were going to be the pilots and going down with the plane if our healthcare staff got sick and they got the COVID-19 then we were going to lose them from the workforce and that would be a tragedy for them and it would also have a serious effect on our overall workforce so we had to think about that really carefully and we had to prepare people for poor outcomes because this was ICU beds we were looking at and in the UK certainly we've got about 50% mortality once you've been intubated. Um, and that's much more significant than what we're normally used to dealing with. On top of that, we had the usual things, which I'm sure are global, that you have to induct people into working in your hospital, tell them what your hospital protocols are, how the fire systems work, how you report sharps injuries and other occupational health issues. And we had to teach them the new standard operating procedures that we developed for our hospital, particularly the new Nightingale hospitals and the protocols. And the biggest challenge was actually most of the people, all our ICU trained staff were already deployed to our massive ICUs and our ever expanding ICUs. And so we had to try and train people up who weren't even ICU personnel to try and work in ICUs. So this was a big part of the challenge for us. So the Nightingale Hospital here, what I'm representing is just, a, I'm just one very small cog in a huge wheel that's created this massive educational change. And I'm just representing my colleagues here today to tell you a bit of our story. Next. So this is where we are. That's me with my bright orange shoes on that everybody got used to spotting as I ran up and down these massive long corridors in front of the Nightingale Hospital. Um, the hospital's based in this big Excel center. Um, as, I, as you can see, there's two components to it and that's one ward on either side of that area effectively with up to 2000 beds in each area. And we started doing our training there, but then we realized because of social distancing and other challenges I'll discuss, we needed more space to do our training so we actually relocated to the O2 on the other side of the river. Next. So on the next slide, we can see that actually, you know, the, this is the east end of London. And you can see this is a Google map. And you can tell how big these buildings are just from how they look on the Google map. There is luckily a tunnel that goes under the river between us and the XL. And there's also a cable car. But unfortunately, that's been closed down, um, which is very disappointing. So the O2 is an arena, it can host up to 20,000 people, and it's used to hosting things like basketball matches, Ariana Grande, Rod Stewart, ATP tennis matches. And the XL itself is another huge space, and this is used to hosting boat shows, Comic-Con. Um, it held three different sports were held there for the Olympics. It was so big that it could host three sports at one time um, and various other things. And it can have up to 70, nearly 70,000 capacity. And here we were trying to re, um, repurpose it into a hospital instead in these mass vast spaces. So how did the education team work overall? Well, as we can see on this next slide, that um, we had to sort of try and bring together education, training and transformation and work across and between ourselves as well as possible. Because we were having the chance of starting a new hospital, we could start everything from scratch. It was such an amazing opportunity just to be able to start again from the beginning and think about how did we want to do this in a new way. So we took all the inputs from the clinical teams, from the clinical supportive teams, such as pharmacy and radiology. We had the quality and safety team who were looking into the practices within the hospital. And they all fed in their information to us and what they thought was required in terms of training. And we had to think about what we thought was core content that had to be delivered as well. And then there was a constant movement between those who were thinking about what the content required was, those who were developing the content and those who were delivering the content. What would actually work? What could we fit into the time? How could we make it all work together? And what has been really good is it's been a completely iterative process so that over the time we've been able to change and adapt. So as the hospitals opened and accepted patients, they could say, this is working really well, but this isn't. Can you look at that? And we would. In 48 hours, we would have changed the program and the training system. We went from trying to train people up for intensive care in one day to going, actually, you know, we really can't fit it into one day. Please, can we have two days of training? 
But the issue was we were having to pay people to come for this training because it was in their time and so it had to go through workforce. But again, 24, 48 hours later, we had an answer. Yes, go to two days because it's patient safety is on the line and the staff safety is on the line and everybody's health is on the line. And we had to make sure if we were going to make this hospital successful, what we were doing was fit for purpose um, and it was safe for the people who were there. Um, so we've been, it's, been, it's been absolutely fascinating. So I'll tell you a little bit about the O2 and what we've been getting up to here. You can see it behind me, actually. Um, in the background, I'm sitting in one of the executive suites and if the uh, lights go off, it's because it's a light activate, movement activated lighting system um, and I'm on my own in here at the moment. But on the next slide, we can see uh, the overview of the O2 arena itself. So this is normally where the tennis court is or where the mosh pit is and other things. And what we've done on the far right hand side, we've set up a stage and that's where the sort of generic induction is all done. But because of social distancing, we can only put people in every other row of seats and in, in, in every third seat as well. So we need some, a certain amount of space. The numbers we were being asked to train was between 250 and 500 people a day through this center. So that's why we needed space and capacity. Um, you can see in the middle, the simulation bays. Um, and we built 24 of these in line with what was going on in the new hospital as well, so that it reflected and we could try and create as experiential an exercise as possible uh, within the limitations of limited equipment. And then we built two teaching pods onto the arena floor um, where we could run some of our larger stations that needed to be done. On the next slide, we can see a layout for generically for the rest of the O2. And we've got full backstage passes, um, which I'm very proud of. Uh, and this gives me access to all the dressing rooms, the locker rooms, the executive suites, um, and everything that we could get our hands on basically to try and work out what was the most appropriate space. A space that you can normally fit 60 people into when you suddenly have to socially distance everybody, keep them as far apart and healthy as possible, rapidly becomes a space for 15 or 20. Um, so we had to think about the requirements of the different classes we were offering and the sessions and therefore whether they needed seats, whether they needed laptops, whether they needed tables and how it was all going to work together. Um, we found the private suites were very good because we could do small group sessions of 10 in each of the private suites and that gave us quite good sort of um, social distancing. And other areas are where the, normally the food and the drinks are kept together. Um, so the next slide gives you sort of an idea of our generic timetable. We run, we've been running different timetables depending on the staff and what their current um, capabilities are and their experiences and what we're expecting them to do. And we streamed these according to colours just to make it easy for ourselves. So this is our most basic training, which was for people who were going to be going into admin roles or technician roles. And actually, they just needed to know about the specifics of being within the hospital arena um, and if there were major emergencies. Um, so everybody was subjected to the usual corporate induction videos of where the fire exits were and what they had to do in an emergency, um, safeguarding um, and important elements like that. And then we also gave them local clinical induction, which was about how the hospital would work, how the shift pattern might work um, and lots of the different policies that would be involved. And then they rotated through various stations. So the core stations were PPE and fit testing, communication, thinking about nonverbal communication and feedback mechanisms. Um, and then in case there was a major incident and we had mass oxygen failure, uh, we had to teach everybody how to grab a bag and valve and attach that to a um, ET tube and to ventilate the patient because we only had a single oxygen supply, which was the biggest challenge actually is setting up these new hospitals was the oxygen supplies. Uh, I should have put a picture of the size of the oxygen tank. It's enormous. It's unbelievable. Um, and then we teach everybody cardiac arresting so that they can be a first responder and do CPR and teaching them about prone positions. And we coined an element called psychological PPE, which is very interesting. And it's about how actually when you go into an environment, not only are you putting on your physical PPE to protect yourself from COVID-19, but you need to put on your psychological PPE, which is to protect you um, from the onslaughts of the emotional events that are going to happen. Um, and the fact that you need to support your body and work together. And how can you recognize the stresses that are going on in order to keep yourself safe and healthy in these environments? And we had to talk, we did it, we found it very quickly important to include a talk on compassionate care in a workshop because lots of people are asking end of life questions. Um, and we thought that was really important. So on the next slide, we can see a combination of all the technical and the non-technical skills that we pulled together. And again, we've kept adding to these as we needed to. So we recognized a lot of non-ICU doctors and nurses didn't know how to do an ICU ward round note or how to fill in an ICU chart. And so we started giving all those non-ICU nurses actually a broken down ICU chart, which in the UK we use the great big things that are sort of double A3, what's that, A2 size, 
and we broke it down into four parts. And as they went around these technical skill stations, they could fill in the chart as they went around. And then the following day, they'd have the chance to come back and do the documentation again so they could reinforce the learning and really try and close the loop on that. Again, the pharmacy, they were worried about what the drug chart looked like. We use electronic prescribing in most of our hospitals in the UK now. So for some of the younger staff, actually going back to a, a paper chart was quite unusual for them and the pre-prescriptions and actually were things going to be in milligrams per mil or micrograms per mil or were they going to have to use drip rates because we've been running out of syringe drivers and things like that in the UK so that was really key and in an ideal situation and when we have less people on a day then we try and get them through all of these different elements and then bring them into a fully immersive simulation at the end which is relevant to their level of expertise. But when we have days with 240 people running through two streams, sometimes people have to do the simulation earlier in the day rather than later. But that's fine. It's all about giving them the opportunities. So the next slide shows some of these different stations in action. Um, and we've got our, my colleagues doing documentation there. We've got our non-verbal communication sign that shows the different um, signals that we've been using and encouraging. We were worried in a single unit with 2,000 patients and no solid walls between it. We were going to end up with very large volumes of noise and would people be able to hear each other? Um, you can see my colleague there in full PPE. In the early days, we were lucky to have this and I'll talk about how things have changed in terms of training with PPE. So the next slide shows how we had to recreate some of the spaces. Um, we tried to take, this is a real picture in the top left corner of one of our wards on the Nightingale Hospital. So it's 42 beds per ward, which is 21 beds on either side, and they're split into six, six bed pods. And these just continue and continue, continue over the whole of the 600 meters to 2,000 beds almost. It's fairly crazy. Um, but here you can see how we try to recreate that within our simulation environment with the kit that we have available. Um, and we've obviously only used every other bay because of social distancing that we can't have people doing simulation in every single bay, not in full PPE. So again, that's an example of where we've had to do social distancing. And in the bottom left, you can see all the chairs are really spread out. Social distancing doesn't make for pretty pictures. Um, the next slide shows how we had to think about the PPE shortages. So in the early days when we seemed to be flush with PPE, we'd get everybody to practice putting it all on. Then they would go into their clinical skills and their simulation stations and they practice doing everything in the full PPE. At Nightingale, we describe this full aerosol generating procedure PPE as your basic uniform. And then every time you see a patient, you put another plastic apron and a second pair of gloves on top and change those every time between each patient. We wanted to try and get people into the process of doing that and encouraging it. However, now we don't have enough PPE, so we've had to make accommodations. We're using FFP2 masks, which we have in abundance, but are not appropriate for seeing COVID-19 patients to train with. So we were using other homemade options and things like that, but this is, these are readily available. So we've managed to get hold of those, which is great. And we've had to make videos, which is what you can see in this picture, so that um, to show what happens in full PE and to try and recreate some of those experiences and challenges so that we only get through five sets of PPE rather than everybody coming through the training. We felt we had to give everybody masks as well because some of the things such as training people how to prone and you have to get five people around a single patient requires you to be closer than two meters in order to do that. So by actually giving people masks and when we had spare face visors, as you can see in this picture, um, then they got to wear those while they were doing the things that required closer contact and provided them some level of protection. We were really concerned about transmitting COVID between our participants and between our faculty and we had to be really mindful of that at all times. Um, next picture shows more issues with the social distancing and so how everybody's really, really spread out um, in the different spaces. But it's actually really nice. It allows for a bit more air to flow and it doesn't feel as sort of, you can feel quite hot and overcome by the end of a day's training. And actually this way, it doesn't feel quite so claustrophobic. Um, so that's nice. And you can see a picture of my birdies that we've been using as our um, symbol for the Nightingale um, training education. Um, we've also been having to play with the spaces that we have available so you can see how we've adapted these classrooms within the main arena and the next slide shows how we've taken um, in the top right hand corner we took the loading bay where they normally bring in all the um, kit for putting on the concerts and putting on the events and actually we've got some bays built in there and have used that for doing training in. Um, manual handling have been moved out into that area now because it's quite full on and they're using it's quite um, you know, it's quite busy, they keep warm because it's actually quite a cold space. It's concrete floors, it's not a proper roof, it's just a canvas roof and you get quite a wind blowing through there. 
Um, and on the left, you can see my colleagues who've um, commandeered the PayPal suite in order to do catheter training and catheter care. And I'm not sure this is what PayPal ever envisaged their, um, their suite being used for, but there we go. We can le live and learn. So the program's been huge. And to date, on the next slide, you can see all the variety of the most common people that we've been training through here in order to get to the hospital. It's remembering we're starting a hospital from scratch. We're having to train every single personnel that are required within a hospital and all through one central program. So we've done probably about two, over 2,000 people now um, through this system. And we've still got, about, um, still got more on the books waiting to come through and to keep coming. And we're really grateful for that. And not only are we training all these people who already have professional registrations and work in other ways, but we got a bit of a surprise when one day 200 people turned up through an agency and they were just volunteers without any healthcare profession. Oh, look, there we go. They have lost my um, <laughs> motion activated lighting. Um, so what we did is we suddenly had all these people turned up and it turned out they were pub landlords or they were, to, they were airline staff or they were people who were bankers and accountants and they had no healthcare training at all. But they were going to be part of the proding teams, they were going to be part of the washing teams, they were going to be the runners and the restockers and able to form really key parts of the team without necessarily having to do direct patient care. So again, we had to adapt our training in order to account for them. One of the big challenges with 2,000 people coming through, 200, 300 people a day, is actually keeping track. We're in this massive arena and how do we know that they don't arrive at the beginning of the day, then disappear off and then come back at the end of the day in order to get their ID badge that's allowing them to go and work in the Nightingale Hospital. So we used a system that's been developed locally in the, um, to us here, which is called CatQR. And this is a, it's an, a class attendance tracker, which basically allows you to sign up and then you use your phone and you can scan into the code every time you go into a class and it registers that you've been in that class. Um, so we've had iPads in every station, but you can do it off a phone or you can preset it and just have a code or print the code out. You don't need to have the electronics there. If you have the electronics in place, then actually you can refresh your class during the class and it'll show you exactly who the people are attending, what their skill mix is and, that, and what their names are. And so actually in a rapid turnover, when you're getting new people in every half an hour or every hour, it allows you to be aware of who these people are you're training. And we've had over 10,000 scans now on our CAT-QR, which provides us with some quality assurance that actually these participants have been through this training at each stage. So this is just a little bit about the huge story and journey that we're still on here in London at NHS Nightingale. I need to thank all my colleagues, especially those people who were there right at the very beginning um, and started off this project. I joined one week in. That's me and my colleague Colette in the bottom corner getting a bit of fresh air on the edge of the Thames on a particularly windy day. Um, and that's us doing a little bit of a sort of TikTok dance just to um, warm ourselves up at the end of the day and do some socially distanced team bonding, which is always a challenge. But um, this has really been a fascinating time for me to be involved in medical education, to rethink it and to think about working with these amazing people and how we can jig things up and do something new. So I hope you'll find it useful too. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd rather be turned over to you if there would be time for questions. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you to all of you uh, for your time, for your experience. And uh, well, now, as Peter says, it's going to be the questions and answer time. Muchísimas gracias a todos los que nos están acompañando en este webinar. Este, agradecemos muchísimo la participación de nuestros ponentes para compartir esta extraordinaria experiencia que tuvieron en Europa con el uso de la simulación. Y pues es el momento de las preguntas y las respuestas. Les voy a pedir para que lo podamos hacer de una manera ordenada. Este, vamos a ir este, viendo a través del de chat para poder este, asignar el turno de hacer alguna pregunta, por favor. Entonces, si alguien tiene una pregunta a través del chat y mencionamos ahí este, el nombre de la persona y le cedemos la palabra. I'm telling the people that they, in order to have some order, uh, to write the question in the chat room and then after that we, we can tell him that can speak through the microphone. Entonces, si alguno de ustedes tiene alguna pregunta, por favor, a través del chat, ahí aparece su nombre y le cedemos la palabra. Okay, Mario Cruz. Doctor, uh, Dr. Mario Cruz, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. 
Well, uh, I, I, I write to questions because my English is very poor, but I, I, find, I, I hope that you understand me. The, the first question is, uh, as we know, uh, COVID-19 has brought a lot of change in our various healthcare systems, but I want to know if, which have been the biggest framework conditions that you may have previously taken for guaranteed in simulation and changes because COVID-19. And the second question is, the, what steps did you take to make sure that the use of simulation in outbreaks like COVID-19 were effective? Uh, if my question is okay, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> May I check the first question? Are you asking what changed in the simulation practice or did you ask what changed in the clinical practice? In simulation, please. Hmm. I, I was surprised that actually suddenly things were possible that you had to kind of discuss for a long time <laughs> in the organization beforehand kind of, you know, getting access to, to participants and, you know, kind of the time for them, for example, you know, suddenly you could run sessions much more easily. And and I think actually people, the perception of si simulation changed from something to, from something like, ah, it's disturbing to go there and what does it really mean and so on, to much more immediately visible, helpful effects. But, I, but Sigun and Libby, I think you can speak to more concrete around these effects. Libby, go first. Um, I think what we, I think I agree with what Peter said that, you know, we're finally getting the chance to showcase what simulation can really do um, and how we can use it as an education modality. And I think showing how reflexive we can be and adaptable has been really important. Um, but I think certainly here at Nightingale, they've recognized the experiential learning as being really key. The opportunity to practice, to be hands-on, to take things away from the theoretical and into the face-to-face -face has been a really key part of it all. And we've been using the sim not only here at the O2, but we've been doing what we've called day zero. So the day before they start their, their placements, they actually go and do... Um, they spend some time on a part of the ward which hasn't got the patients, but it does have a mannequin and it allows them to reorientate with the area and to do some in situ simulation, which marries up with sort of what we talked about in terms of close to situ simulation. And I think that's just really helped people to relieve anxieties of dealing with situations they feel outside their control. I, we need to do some research into it, but I suspect if we went and looked and spoke to the participants and why did they feel more prepared after this induction than other ones, I think it's the practicality of it, the experiential element that's key. Does that partly answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> it's very <laughs> clear. <laughs> Sorry. I think also I, I totally agree with uh, Libby. It's fascinating to interact with an organization and people at different levels who know different things about education. Um, obviously it's very, very efficient to put videos, demonstration videos out and that people can click through those. And then there's, a, there's some sense of accomplishment by that. But we also saw people who'd seen the videos and they've come to lectures about donning and doffing PPE. And then we said, okay, stand up and do it peer to peer. Perfect. And that was totally different for them. So experiential learning is very, very powerful. But like you asked, um, maybe about the, the, the way COVID-19 has affected simulation. Um, you need to do it. You really, really want people to feel safe and, and have a sense of e efficacy, self-efficacy. Uh, but it's that social distancing and not creating risks and creating infectious disease problems with simulation, right? Um, so we've had to walk a fine line there, you know? How many people can observe? Should we get people, does everyone need to be in the room? Can we space out a little bit? And it's also, um, obviously uh, made that we have to be much, much more efficient with our debriefing. The structure of the debriefing is the same, okay. but it's more plus delta, much more urgent, much more, you know, space out, open the windows in the room if we can, you know, and let's be very efficient. Let's get this done as efficiently as we can. And that's, that's not like, that's not quite what we like as, as simulation educators. You also asked about what effects this had in the clinical world. 
um, the simulation. It's just, I've seen two major effects. Uh, people are so appreciative that they can practice these things. And often, especially uh, junior doctors who have to quickly be uh, elevated to be more senior staff now, they get the chance to do simulation just in time. And they appreciate it. And they maybe come up to us after the debriefs and say, this was great. I've never had to run a team before. I, I've never done this before. It was so great to do this before an actual patient. That's something, that's why we do this. And sometimes I forget it, I take it for granted, but just to hear the clinicians really come and say thank you is, is terrific. And, and then the incredible um, quick way we can uh, test the protocols and find out how to improve the environment, how to improve the protocols. We did that with simulation. The only problem is disseminating the information to all the other colleagues that weren't there. That's a, that's, that's a huge bottleneck, it's very difficult. Well, thank you so much. Yo inglés es más, mejor de mi español. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Libby. <laughs> well, that was great. Uh, Edith, ¿quieres hacer la pregunta o la traduzco? Uh, I have a question from Edith, but I'm asking her if, if she wants to... Traducirla. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to translate it. Uh, Edith uh, is, asking, uh, is, is asking about uh, how did you measure the results of this simulation with, uh, with your groups? How did you assess this, uh, the results? We haven't done much assessment at the moment because we're just so busy delivering and surviving. And we recognize this is, a, for us, it's a real um, gaping hole. We've got plans in place to try and develop some research and some proper evaluation of it. But um, yeah, we're, we're desperate to do more. It's all word of mouth at the moment. And it's more just direct saying, yes, thank you. That was great. I mean, we've had, we've been overwhelmed. People saying it's the best induction they've ever been on. They've never had training like this. They've never felt this prepared. You know, I think it echoes what Sigrun has been saying about how people after the debriefs and how effective they felt it is. And so we've had very positive feedback from there. But we've also made sure we have a debrief at the end of every day where people can ask questions and we've used things like Slido so people can ask the questions and put them forwards there but we haven't done a proper evaluation. Sigrun hopefully may have done, I don't know. Oh yes, we've solved everything. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what we've done is we have, uh, before the COVID uh, emergency, we had established on our RegSim, it's called RegSim.no, it's a homepage we have and uh, one of my colleagues developed um, an online evaluation so the um, Kirkpatrick level two, what have you learned? Did you like it? Was it relevant? Was it useful? Do you have any suggestions for the simulation team? And what, what did you learn today? You know, what do you take with you? So some of our in situ teams, as some of the facilitators have been asking people to go and use those in the COVID times now, haven't had a chance to look at any of them, um, but also, but the senior facilitators can look at that. Uh, but also many of our teams have, uh, when we run the simulations, we take notes afterwards, we compile uh, a list of bullet points of things for the system or things about competency and we send it to uh, the people who are in charge of the systems, the leads, the educators where they work so that at least we fed it back into the system. Um, in terms of team evaluation, we're const we have three daily briefings um, within our team. We have an eight o'clock start of the day briefing, we have a midday briefing for what we're learning from the clinical side, what we're learning within the education side, what the programs we're developing in terms of that. We have a five o'clock briefing for the staff and then at, at the end of every day there's a faculty debrief as well so they're constantly feeding back all that bit. So yeah, in terms, we're not doing much evaluation from the participants perspective but we're constantly evaluating and adapting and changing our practice within the um, the, the people who are delivering the education and how we're delivering it. And that has been really, really robust, actually, so. Thank you very much. Uh, I have another question from uh, Dr. Brenda J. Uh, Dr. Brenda J asked if you have a, a place that the members from the Mexican society can see all this simulation, a video, or if you have some kind of, of, of YouTube channel or something, where we can see all these uh, enormous drills that you are doing uh, with the simulation, especially the ones in the in the stadium that you are living. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know um, if you have something like that. Yeah, we're still 
because we've been writing and rewriting, I don't know anybody here who's done research and you don't want to publish because you know it's not quite ready and you want to find another answer and you want to look at it and get it a little bit better. You know, working here is a bit like that, that every day we're improving and we're changing. So we have been sharing all our lesson plans and all our simulations and things across the Nightingale hospitals within the UK, but we haven't been sharing them. <coughs> with However, I have been asking constantly about the, you know, the um, intellectual property rights and at what point we are going to be able to share a lot more of this information because for me, one of the things that's been amazing about the COVID outbreak has been the sharing of information between all the different hospitals, countries, institutions, um, you know, and actually how much has just been pinging around on the international COVID WhatsApp groups and whatever else it might be. And I feel bad that we, we're not still partaking in that from here, but I suddenly in a much larger system where I have to be aware of corporate communications and not getting myself into trouble. <laughs> don't worry, thank you. Sigrun, maybe, I don't know. No, we, um, uh, we haven't filmed anything. We haven't made any videos. Uh, what we, sorry, again, I'd have to go through, I'd have to take a lot more uh, considerations and ask everybody before the simulation if we could use the filming. Actually, I think my stroke doctor is filming because he has a research protocol from before COVID-19 where they video film the simulations and the debriefs. But again, that's just for use for research. Uh, but like Libby said, um, lots of sharing going along, going around, and we established a Norwegian uh, national webinar. I've run it four times now. We try and get people from the whole country just to, just to show up and talk just five minutes about what they've done with simulation. And no PowerPoint, no slides, just keep it easy. And uh, we've had, you know, around 70 people each time listening and participating. And it's been a great way to bring people together in the country, at least. Um, I could show you one of our videos via screen share now, but, um, or sort of introduction to it. But I think, wait, I'll try and see if I can get it shared. A couple of them I think we should be able to share out with, which would be much better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have another question. Let me see. Uh, Dr. Salvador Espinosa from Spain. Uh, he's asking about uh, if you know how many healthcare uh, professionals, unfortunately, uh, have acquired the COVID-19 in your country because he, he is from Spain and it has been a great problem. And he wants to know about the experience in other countries about the number of healthcare personnel affected by COVID if you have any information about this. I heard that figure for Denmark, but I forgot. <laughs> How about you, Libby? Yeah, um, I, know that, I know that we've had over 100 deaths of healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how many have been infected because we've not been doing much testing of people unless we need to because we haven't had enough tests. In the UK, we've had uh, 19,000 patients admitted to hospital uh, for oxygen therapy or intensive care. And we've had 26,000 deaths that are currently being attributed to COVID-19. Um, but as we know, the figures are very difficult to compare because everybody's reporting in different ways. Um, and whether people are including only people who've been tested positive or in our elderly care homes, if two people test positive, they don't test anybody else in the care home because it's because of resources. So we're suddenly this week, we're massively increasing our ability to test people to see who is positive or not. But we've had very limited ability to do that. So we've had to ration our resources significantly. So I certainly know at times we've been really struggling with the number of healthcare staff off. But that's partly because we've had to self-isolate until we've had tests. So we've had people off work for seven days or 14 days without actually necessarily knowing if it's necessary. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I could answer you. I don't know. Uh, also, our numbers are all, anyway, much smaller than uh, other larger countries. But uh, we've had some episodes where up to 50 nurses or healthcare people, I just had to Google it, uh, have had to be uh, isolated or gotten corona and been sent home. Uh, and I know in Iceland, I have good connection with people in Iceland, and uh, uh, the ICU was really hit hard because, uh, like, several people from one of the ICU units had been to Austria on a ski trip and came home and that just wiped out a lot of the, the capability or ability of the ICU for quite a while. Um, right, but um, that's all I can answer, sorry. Um, I wish you well in Spain. Yeah, good luck in Spain. I don't think, yeah, I think you've had a very, very difficult time there. 
Yes, that's right. Ok, eh, no sé si hay alguna otra pregunta este, a través del chat para nada más darles la palabra y si no, con mucho gusto hacemos el esfuerzo por traducir la pregunta que usted tenga. Ok. Well, meanwhile we have another question. I just want to say that on behalf of the Mexican Society for Simulation uh, Members, I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing this amazing experience with all of us. It's an honor to have all, all of you in this webinar. And uh, we hope that this, this is going to be the first of many times that we can share information between all of our countries. And it will be a pleasure to, to see you again in, a, in another webinar. And I hope to see you in in person uh, here in Mexico, <laughs> so, uh, maybe so. so whenever you want to visit Mexico, please uh, just uh, write us and I'm sure that many of our members will be very happy to have you in their, uh, in their, in their city and uh, to also give you a, a tour around uh, uh, all the very beautiful places in Mexico and also in Latin America because we also have many friends not only from Mexico but also from Central and South America. So thank you very much. Uh, just let me see. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Many people is just writing. Thank you very much. No hay ninguna otra pregunta por parte del público. Parece que no. I think. That, I think well, then that's also from our side. Hey, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to us, right? So much appreciated. I think the, the exchange, like you say, between the continents, actually, between different people is so, so valuable. And I, I really think, you know, kind of this two-way exchange is just great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And good luck. I hope you're all staying safe and staying well. And um, be careful out there. It's a dangerous yeah. world at the moment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Okay. Have a bye. nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Gracias a todos los que nos acompañaron en este webinar. Que tengan muy buen día, cuídense mucho y espero vernos pronto próximamente todos. Chao. Gracias, Edgar. Cuídate mucho. Muchas gracias, doctor. Hasta luego. No tiene nada que agradecer, un gusto. Gracias, Edgar. Gracias, Edgar. Hasta luego. No de nada, hasta luego.